the incarnation basically happened to fulfill God's promises first to Adam, where it's recorded in Genesis that uh, there would come a seed that would crush the serpent's head. It's, it's also a fulfillment of God's promises to David, where he promises David that there would come one who would establish an everlasting kingdom. And also a fulfillment of the, uh, of the promises of God to the Israelites that there would come a Messiah to redeem them from their sin. One of the reasons why I believe that the person of Christ is important is because it is through Christ that um, every Christian, everyone finds their identity. So Jesus Christ is mentioned uh, in the Bible as one who comes to redeem us from our sins. And not only is he seen as a redeemer and uh, a savior, but he is seen as one who is God. In fact, I think the book of John, uh, among other very uh, many texts, help us to understand that Jesus Christ is fully God. And he came and he was fully man and he died on the cross uh, a cruel death so that uh, those whom Christ, I mean those whom God had pointed to eternal life will uh, receive eternal life. I think Christianity is not Christianity if Jesus Christ is not uh, mentioned or his teachings not upheld. In mentioning the, the coming of Jesus Christ in light of the prophecies of the Old Testament. One striking thing is you realize that uh, Jesus Christ appears all the way from the book of Genesis. So for example the book of Genesis chapter 3 and uh, verse 15 uh, when God is banishing man because of sin Adam and Eve he says that and the seed of the uh, woman would crush the serpent. That was the first ever prophecy of the coming of Christ who would come then to triumph over evil, sin and death and uh, God gets into a, a, a relationship or rather covenant with, with Abraham and uh, Abraham is promised that uh, uh, he'll be a father of many nations and out of, out of his, op his offspring will come a savior. And so we see the proclamation of a coming savior uh, in the book of Genesis, you see in the book of Exodus, for example, vividly when you look at uh, the, the, the story of the Israelites moving from uh, Egypt to the promised land and they get to this place in the book of Numbers where uh, they're being beaten by snakes and, and, and Moses is commanded to uh, hoist uh, a bronze snake and so we see in the book of John chapter 3 verse 14 uh, uh, the writer of the book of John referring to that very incident and saying that the son of man must be lifted uh, is lifted up so in other words what we are seeing even from the beginning is that Christ is actually coming as the ultimate salvation of, of men and so all these images and, and and then you see in the book of I mean when you see all the prophecies that are made uh, in the time uh, of pre-exile and post-exile uh, we see people like Isaiah for example in Isaiah chapter 53 talking about the suffering servant. And every single description there is literally about Christ who is coming. Not, not as a king who comes with political power, but one who comes to die um, as, uh, a sinless death uh, because of sinful man. Um, and um, I think that almost every prophet in the Bible talks about the coming of Jesus Christ and the very many events that are types of that very, very uh, uh, coming of Christ. There are two very distinct things about Jesus Christ, namely his virgin birth and uh, his resurrection. The virgin birth, I think there's a couple of things to say about that. Um, and the first uh, would be that it's kind of a fulfillment of prophecy. So Matthew um, records it in this way, she will bear a son, you, will, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Well, this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. That's quoting Isaiah 7, 14. What's interesting about that is it's, it's probably what theologians refer to as a typological fulfillment. That means um, that it had a previous fulfillment in Isaiah's day, um, and then the fulfillment in Christ's day is, is an escalation, if you like. It's, it's a greater fulfillment. So in Isaiah's day, uh, Jerusalem was 
was surrounded and the, and the faithless king Ahaz was asked to, uh, was asked by the Lord, uh, ask the Lord for a sign. Um, and he refused to ask for a sign. He, he didn't trust in the Lord. And, and so Isaiah came to him and said, nevertheless, I will give you this sign um, that the virgin or the young woman shall bear a son and she shall call his name Emmanuel. And, and that's the sign that God is going to save his people. In other words, the, the birth of this son is the demonstration that God is going to deliver his people uh, from the situation that they find themselves in under siege. And Matthew says, well, yeah, just as in that day, God's people were under siege, they were under uh, foreign oppression um, and, and so forth. And God gave this sign that he was still with them, hence the naming of the, of the child. Um, God gave that sign in that day. Now he has given an even greater sign. Not only is there a child born, but this child is actually God with us. And therefore he is going to deliver us, not merely from foreign oppression, but in fact from our sins. But then the second thing is to say that really Christ coming of a virgin uh, enables him to um, establish, if you like, a new humanity. So up until the time Christ came, there was one way of being human in Adam. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, in Adam, all die, but in Christ, all are made alive. In other words, the sin of Adam had passed to all those who are in a direct way descended from him by the normal way of conception. But in Christ, a new form of humanity uh, comes so that we're not defined any longer by our sin. If we're in Christ, we're defined by the righteousness that he enacted. Um, and therefore that enables us then to live a very different life and to receive a very different verdict from God. The nature of man is that he is totally sinful. Uh, the nature of man is that he is desperately wicked. Romans chapter 3 verse 23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So then it means that no one among all this would, uh, would have the uh, opportunity or rather the, the leverage of dying for the sins of many. And so Jesus Christ, who is sinless, uh, and, and you see the virgin birth is, is such that he is conceived of the Holy Spirit. That means he is without blemish. Uh, his blood is not like our blood. So the virgin birth is important because we see the sinlessness of Christ, the purity and the holiness of him, even as he comes to uh, procure this very grand mission of saving man from from sin and damnation. For, for Christ to be a savior, he couldn't be merely a heavenly Christ. He had to come to earth. Um, so Hebrews 2.10, for it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. In heaven, there's no suffering that God is going to go through. Um, and, and so in order for Jesus to be made perfect, whatever that means, he has to come to earth and be made perfect in the same way that we are made perfect. That's the, the, the author's point there. But then in, in chapter five, the author will go on then to say, being made perfect by his uh, you know, coming in the flesh, being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So if he hadn't come in the flesh, he wouldn't have been able to give salvation to his people. The significance of that, I think, is that God has this appreciation uh, for um, an obedience that is costly, if I can put it that way. God loves costly obedience. Um, so you notice, for example, when God is testing Job in the book of Job, um, it's not that Satan came up to God and said, I want to test this servant of yours to see whether he's true. It's actually that God went to Satan and said, have you seen Job? Um, I want you to see what faithful humanity looks like. And of course, Job to some extent passes that test, though he also repents at the end of the book. That Jesus comes as this, if you like, this greater Job. Um, so that he would live through suffering and persevere through suffering and stay faithful to all of God's purpose. And, and God has such um, an appreciation for that, if you like. Um, and, and that's what enables him then to be able to give us this eternal salvation. Jesus Christ comes to identify with, with man, to identify with the situation of man, to identify with the situation of hopelessness, 
uh, of man. Jesus Christ comes, first of all, to announce his kingdom and, um, and in other words, to inaugurate uh, the kingdom of God. Um, and, and I think that is exactly why he has to be like us. Um, Ephesians, I mean, Philippians chapter 2 talks about the aspect of the humility of Christ and Paul is actually pointing out the fact that uh, Jesus Christ did not count equality with God as something to be grasped. In other words, he was portraying an upside down uh, form of kingdom such that if I am to be your savior, then I am to serve you through my death uh, and my resurrection and identify with you. For example, in John chapter 11, as he identifies with the mourning and groaning of men uh, uh, in the, to the death of Lazarus and he comes and brings him to life so that we see a God who sympathizes with our weaknesses, uh, Hebrews chapter 9, and he is listening to us. So in fact, the writer of Hebrews says we should not fear. Uh, we should come to God, uh, with, we should approach the throne of God with confidence. Why? Because Jesus Christ has identified with us. And I believe that's the core uh, uh, of the incarnation of Christ, or rather the Christ becoming human. And in any way, does it, it doesn't at all interfere with, if you would say, the godness or rather the deity or the divinity of Christ. God's plan of redemption being something that was there right from the beginning, right after the fall of man, God promises uh, a seed that would crush the serpent's head and defeat the enemy. Christ's coming was not a fulfillment of an establishment of an earthly king, but it was God's plan of redemption, to redeem man and re to reconcile man and to himself. What is needed in terms of our redemption is really two things. You need someone who can pay the price of our sin, uh, and we'll talk about that later obviously, but you need someone who can pay the price of our sin, but someone who is also related to us. Um, the concept of kinsman redeemer, it's only the, it's only the from, the, from the Old Testament, it's only a close relative who can bring redemption. He has to be able to pay, that's why Christ needs to be God, but he has to be closely related so that he can actually pay on our behalf. Um, and so he has to be both God and God. So Christ had to come fully righteous and fully pure and fully holy, and also uh, to come in the form of man so that he would effectively die for the sin of man. So it was absolutely a plan of God for a redeeming savior and not an earthly king to overthrow the Roman Empire, as the people had thought. Romans chapter 8, verse 3 and 2, 4 says, For what the law could not do, uh, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to uh, the Spirit. For those who are according to the flesh, set their minds on the, on the things of the flesh. For those who are according to the Spirit, uh, the things of the Spirit. Um, for as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Even so, through the obedience of the one, uh, the many will be made righteous. Right from the Old Testament, the law is instituted that man may follow it, and from that they may be righteous. But we were totally incapable of that. We find uh, right from the fall we are incapable of leading fully righteous and holy lives, and the law being instituted, instituted to do that, you are still incapable of living fully righteous and holy lives. We couldn't fulfill the law uh, because of one thing that we have the Adamic nature in us, that sin has become our root, you know. Um, Jeremiah talks about, Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter nine, uh, talks about the heart of man being desperately wicked, Jeremiah 10 verse 17. And this heart is unable in any way to express any, anything, anything of righteousness that can, can please the Lord. Uh, I would say Romans 3.23 comes in again very, very strongly. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So man is continually ill in his nature. The book of Ephesians chapter 2 says we were enemies in our minds, you know, to the Lord. We were dead 
in our transgressions. So in other words, we are unable, uh, we do not have any resources in us that are capable of bringing out anything of righteousness that can reach the standard of what God uh, requires. In fact, it's interesting that when Isaiah is writing, he says your righteousness, you know, uh, is like filthy rugs. Yeah, it's very interesting that, that according to God, no man at all uh, in our deeds, in everything that we do, can please the Lord. Yeah. And that is why Jesus Christ has to come. One who is one with the Father, one who is perfect and righteous, so that he can redeem man from his hopelessness and sin. Uh, Christ fulfills the law. Uh, he does not abolish the law as he affirms. In his life, he leaves the law to every detail of it and he, he actively obeys the law and we therefore become beneficiaries of that obedience when he dies for our sin and our sin is imputed on him. We become beneficiaries of Christ's active obedience of the law. One way it's often talked about, and this is, and I completely agree with this, is that Christ needed to himself have righteousness so that he could impute that, that is to place it upon those who are his people. Um, so, so that when it comes to God looking for the righteous person, it's not just that, that Christ has cleansed our sins and then we have to work towards that righteousness, but rather Christ has given us the fullness of his righteousness so that, so that we are acceptable in God's sight. That's, that's one aspect of it. One that I think is less talked about and it's closely linked is when you look through the Old Testament, you, there are a number of covenants that God makes with man. And he makes those covenants on the basis um, of a covenant mediator. Um, so, so, for example, if you look at 2 Samuel 7, um, he makes a covenant with David. And what he, and, and, and as you read through the chapter, that covenant is, it, it's, in a sense, it's a promise that God will fulfill it. Um, it's certain to come to fruition. And yet, in another sense, he requires obedience of the, of the sons of David. Otherwise, they'll be uh, wiped out uh, from, from fulfilling God's purposes. And, and how does God merge those two aspects, this unconditional aspect and this conditional aspect? Well, he is looking for a faithful son, someone who will obey the law perfectly. And that's what, that's what Jesus comes to do so that he can, in a sense, merge all of those covenants of the Old Testament and, and bring in the new covenant in which he is the faithful covenant mediator and in which he will then bring all of the blessings of that covenant to his people because of his righteousness. If he wasn't righteous, he couldn't have fulfilled the Davidic covenant. If he wasn't righteous, he couldn't have fulfilled these other covenants that come in place to establish the relationship that God has with his people. Um, and so he has to fulfill the law in order for that to be true of him and in order therefore to bring redemption to us. So in essence, um, the fulfillment of the law is key for our salvation. Yeah, uh, a disobedient Jesus, not that we can even imagine such a thing, but a disobedient Jesus couldn't have saved us. We see Christ performing various miracles. He, he raises the dead, he, he calms storms, he heals diseases, he heals people of various ailments. The, the miracles that Jesus does tend to reveal something about Jesus, something about his, his nature. So, for example, if you look through the Gospel of John, you'll find that oftentimes he does a miracle and closely associated with that miracle is a statement that he makes beginning with the words, I am. For example, he opens the eyes of a blind man in chapter 9 and then in the response to what happens, um, then he declares, I am the, the good shepherd. In other words, this, this man was wandering blind, um, wandering far from the flock, and here am I to bring him back, to give him sight so that he can follow well. So, so Jesus is displaying by that, that truly he is the good shepherd by the, by the work done, by the miracle done, as well as by the teaching that follows. But another aspect of the miracles is that oftentimes Jesus would reveal something about his kingdom uh, through those miracles. So for example, this is a, a dangerous example, uh, but when he brings, uh, when he changes the water into wine, the first miracle that John records him doing, um, it's probably a, a deliberate uh, 
evidence that he's fulfilling um, Amos 9, which talks about the hills dripping with sweet wine in the day when the Lord brings restoration to his people. And, and what seems to be happening is Jesus is saying, the day is here. Um, and here is my kingdom of abundance. You see the same thing when he provides bread um, and, and, and fish to all the people. Here is my kingdom coming in abundance. And this is, yes, it's not, it's not fully here yet, but that's the kingdom to which we look forward. When we get to heaven, it will be abundant with, with goodness. Um, and, and Jesus gives evidence of that. When we get to heaven, there'll be no death and Jesus raises people. When we, when we get there, there'll be no sickness. Jesus heals people. When we get there, there will be nothing unclean and Jesus casts out unclean spirits. So all of these things are really pointing to what is, this, what is the nature of this kingdom that Jesus is coming to establish uh, and, and really gives us a great foretaste of what that will be like. Miracles were to make us, or rather were to be instruments of the audience of the Bible to understand really who Jesus was and to believe in him. And the greatest sign, of course, was the sign of him dying on the cross and rising from the dead. And so I think that if we look at miracles as something that we should always have and, and, and get for our benefit, we lose the point because miracles were basically just signs pointing to a reality, and the reality is Jesus Christ. And so I don't think that miracles should be normative, because if you want miracles to be normative, then you should objectively be able to see miracles happen every other time. And if you think about miracles being normative, then you are challenging the very sovereignty of God. I think that miracles are supposed to point us to something that is even way greater than the miracles themselves, and that is Christ. Well, I, th I think summarizing everything that we've talked about so far, um, these things are of a necessity to us because if, if Jesus was still in heaven, there would be no salvation. If Jesus was disobedient, there would be no salvation. But if his, if his life looked different than how it looked, if the miracles look different than how they looked or if there weren't any, we, we wouldn't really know what we're looking forward to. Um, so the combination of all of these things not only secures the possibility of our salvation, um, but, but really gives us that great hope to look forward so that, so that as Abraham was doing, we can be looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God, because we, we've seen the one who, um, you know, labored along with God in creation. We've seen him. We know what kind of city he would build. So we have that, that great hope from the way he lived his life that this, if this is the reflection of who God is, if this is the radiance of the glory of God, then we're really looking forward to what is coming. We're really looking forward to when he establishes the new heaven and the new earth and we get to dwell with him. That's, that's a great hope that we have. If he hadn't come in the flesh, we wouldn't necessarily even know how to process that. Um, so, so it gives us that great hope.